Hey boys and girls, today we're going to be reading chapter seven of Mick Hart Was Here. And the title of this chapter is um, Dogs Can Laugh in Heaven. So if you'd like to follow along with me, please uh, go to uh, Google Classroom and pull up your um, electronic copy of Mick Hart Was Here, okay? And let's go ahead and begin. Dogs Can Laugh in Heaven. I went back to school the Tuesday after the memorial service. That's when I found out I was famous. Zoe and I were walking into the building when we passed a bunch of sixth graders standing outside the door. As I reached for the door handle, I heard one of them say, hey, look, there's the sister of the dead kid. My blood went cold when I heard that and my stomach heaved so violently I thought I might get sick. I ran inside and I ducked into the girls' bathroom. But by the time I got there, the shock had worn off and I was just plain mad. Ignore him, said Zoe. The kid's a total moron, but she knew there was no way I could ignore something like that. And a second later, I was outside again, pushing my way through the crowd of kids till I found the creep who said it. I shoved him up against the wall and I pointed my finger in his face. Don't you ever call my brother the dead kid again. Do you hear me? His name was Mick Hart. And from now on, if you want to talk about him, which you're not even fit to do, you are to use his name. You got that creep? Do you have that? When Zoe pulled me away, I was shaking so hard, I couldn't stop. I didn't care though. It was right for me to do that. And I'd do it again, I swear to God I would. I wasn't sure what to expect when I went to my first class. In the back of my mind, I Suppose I thought it would be a little like the memorial service. People would come up and say they were sorry and all. And then I'd say thanks or something equally stupid, but we'd get through it. Only it turned out it was a lot easier than I imagined because nothing happened at all. That is, unless you count how quiet the room got when I walked in and how everyone pretended they weren't really looking at me when the whole time they were, uh, they were, plainly sneaking peeks as I walked to my desk, all except uh, all except Elaine Fentendorf, that is, Elaine turned right around in her chair and followed and followed me straight to my seat. <clears throat> I stared her at her until she turned back. Don't ever get into a staring contest with me, by the way, you'll never win. Elaine Fentendorf knows that now she was in three of my morning classes and I stared her down in every one of them. Just for the record though, by lunchtime, not one single person had come up to me to say they were sorry. No one had even said Mick's name. They're not trying to be mean, Phoebe. They just don't know what to say, Zoe told me. I tried to shrug it off. Yeah, well, no big deal, I said. But when we sat down to eat, my so-called real friends waved the uh, waved from the other end of the lunch table and quickly looked away. I finally lost it. I glared at them like you wouldn't believe. I'm not going to go nuts if you talk about him, you know? What's wrong with you guys anyway? Didn't you ever go to, uh, didn't you go to grief counseling? Zoe said that you were there, but you must have, must not have been listening because we're all supposed to be saying Mick's name, remember? Uh, Kara Cook looked totally mortified. Yeah, but, we just weren't sure if we should or not, Phoebe. I mean, we didn't want to make you feel worse or anything. Yeah, right. Like that was even possible. Then all at once, Lindy Nelson uh, sort of lunged for my hand and squeezed it way too tight. And Amy uh, Leitner blurted out something incredibly stupid about how her mother said to say hi to my mother. I pretty much learned my lesson after that. I didn't force them to talk anymore. Mostly I just sat there staring at my hoagie while the three of them crammed their lunches down their throats so they could get the heck away from me. Their mouths were still were still full when they took their trays back. After they were gone, I put my head down on the table and I didn't move, not even after the bell rang. Zoe stayed with me till the cafeteria had emptied and then I heard her, and then I heard her calm, quiet voice next to my ear. Phoebe, I think you should go to the nurse and ask her to let you go home. I nodded blankly and I stood up. Zoe 
walked me to the hall. I never made it all the way to the nurse though. To get to her office, you have to go through the main reception area. And Mrs. Barry, Barry Hill was there. As soon as she saw me, she put her arms around me and stared and stared me through her door. It's too bad she didn't have a clue about the kind of mood I was in. Maybe then she wouldn't have been so quick to tell me about how she had lost her own mother two years ago and how losing a family member is the worst kind of pain there is and how in time I would learn to accept my loss and go on. I stood up. He's not my loss, Mrs. Berry Hill. I told her. I didn't just misplace him or leave him behind on a bus somewhere. He died, okay? Mick died, but he will never, ever be lost. So please do not say that word to me one more time. I didn't wait for her to reply. I just turned around and I ran out of her office as fast as I could. I didn't stop either. I kept right on going out of the building, down the block and up the street to my house. Nana from Florida was already talking to Mrs. Barry Hill on the phone. I ignored her finger snapping at me as I blitzed down the hall to Mick's room. Then quietly, I pulled his door shut behind me. This time, I had known from the start where I was headed. I went straight to Mick's bed and I crawled underneath his covers. And then I buried my face in his pillow and I breathed in the smell of him. In my dream, I was sitting in Mrs. Barry Hill's office only... Her office wasn't inside the school. It was outside in the middle of a forest, which I realize sounds totally stupid, but in dreams, stuff like that seems perfectly normal. Anyway, at first, Mrs. Berry Hill was nowhere in sight, but then I looked into the woods and I saw her darting in and out from behind the trees, the way cartoon characters do sometimes when you're trying to find someone. Hey, Mrs. Berry Hill, who are you looking for? I shouted out, only she was too far away to hear me. And that's when I decided to help her in her search. And I stood up on her chair and I hollered out, Ali Ali Oxy Free, which is sort of the international kids language for come out, come out, wherever you are. And so I wasn't surprised when I heard a bunch of feet running through the forest in my direction. Only the weird thing was the feet didn't belong to a kid. They belonged to Wocket, our old dog. She trotted out of the trees, happy as anything, wearing her old red cowboy hat, plus these four little red cowboy boots on her feet, which were like the cutest little things you'd ever seen. Then right behind her came Mick. He was carrying a box of cereal and wearing, his, and wearing this amazing t-shirt that flashed his name on and off in hot pink neon letters. So like you couldn't forget forget it even if you tried m-i-c-k 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 i'm talking about the coolest t-shirt you can imagine and since he was holding so tight to the cereal box i figured that that's where it must have come from so naturally i tried to grab it to see if there was one in there for me too only what do you know mick refused to hand it over the next thing i knew we were wrestling on the top of Mrs. Barry Hill's desk, and Mick had me in a sleeper hold, which he thought was pretty funny, I guess, because he was grinning from ear to ear, and Wocket must have thought so too, because all of a sudden I heard this weird snorting sound, and when I looked on the ground, Wocket was laughing so hard she was rolling over on her back with her little boots up in the, up in the air. It was the funniest thing I'd ever seen. So funny I woke myself up, I woke myself up laughing which I never even heard of anyone doing before. And it must have been loud because right away I heard Mick's door open. I was sure it was Nana from Florida coming to yell at me for ditching school, but it wasn't her at all. It was my mother just standing there staring at me with this horrible look on her face. And all I could think about was how awful it must be for her to open the door and see me in Mick's bed like that. I started to ramble. I, I dreamed about him. My mother's eyes closed. No, wait, Mom, you don't understand. It was a good dream. It was a funny dream. Wocket was, was in it, too, and so was Mrs. Berryhill. I think that's because when I saw her today, she kept calling Mick my loss. But you see, he's never going to be lost, Mom. I swear to God he's not, because Zoe and I sort of figured out that he's everywhere now. And if you're everywhere, then you can't be lost. Mom's face softened a little. In my dreams, we were fighting and wrestling around and stuff, but it's okay to remember that we were used to fight, don't you think? I mean, Mick would 
would probably hate it if we tried to turn him into some perfect little angel or something. Because after all, he did put a lot of effort into annoying us sometimes, you know. I stopped for a second. Like, remember how mad we'd all get when we'd do that disgusting fake sneeze on the last piece of pie so, so, so nobody else would have it. And remember how irritating it was? Uh, he was on our last vacation. You even made him sit in the car when we went to McDonald's. And that one time, remember, you said he was demented. My mother looked away. Stop it, Phoebe. You know perfectly well. I was kidding when I said that. I tried not to grin. You were not, mother. You were furious at him. And you know why, too. She waited a minute before she spoke again. I was I wasn't furious. I was just irritated. I mean, for heaven's sake, who wouldn't be? He wouldn't stop talking like Elmer Fudd. He talked like Elmer Fudd for three solid days in a row. I covered my smile with my hand. You brought him back an egg McMuffin, remember? And you said if he talked like Elmer Fudd one more time, you weren't going to take him to Disneyland. I bit my lip. Remember what he called you then? By the time I could tell, by, by the time... By this time, I could tell that my mother was fighting to keep a straight face. She sucked in her cheeks. He called me a waskly wabbit, she managed. But as soon as she said it, she started to laugh. We both did. She came into the room then. It must have been unbelievably hard for her to do that, but she came in and sat down on the edge of his bed. I made a place for her next to me on Mick's pillow, but for the longest time, Mom just sat there stroking her fingers lightly over his bedspread. And then... At last, she laid down beside me and gently brushed the hair from my eyes. Tell me some more about your dream, she whispered. I told her that dogs can laugh in heaven. That night, Nana from Florida made spaghetti for dinner. When I heard her carrying the plates in to set the table, I rushed in as fast as I could. We don't eat at the, at the dining room and in the dining room anymore, Nana. We eat on trays in front of the TV, remember? She waved me away. Can't eat spaghetti off the tray. Slop it down the front of you. Yeah, I know, said Nana, but still I don't, I know, Nana, but still I don't think we should. My grandmother's arms flew into the air. Shoo, skedaddle, scat, she said. Nana from Florida has cats. It explains a lot. An hour later, she called us to dinner by banging on the spaghetti pot with a metal spoon. Only when we got there, all of the placemats were at the wrong spots, like my father's placemat was mixed old spot. My mother's iced tea glass was there where Pop had always sat. Meanwhile, my milk was right across from was right across from him where Mom used to sit, and Nana from Florida was next to me. Mom was already shaking her head. No, when my grandmother came through the door with this heavy platter of spaghetti in her hands, hollering hot, 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 she hurried to sit uh, to set it down, and that's when we noticed. Uh, and that's when she noticed us standing there, staring at the placemats. Oh, poop, she said. I guess crazy old Nana got everyone all catawampus, didn't I? Then, as usual, her patience was gone and her hands were waving all around in the air again with that same metal spoon. Well, won't kill you, will it? Sit down before the stuff gets cold. I was halfway through my spaghetti before I realized what an amazing thing my grandmother had done. Accidentally, on purpose, she had gotten us back to the table, eating as a family again, and no one was staring at Mick's empty chair. Nana from Florida, who would have thought it? Thank you for listening to uh, this chapter. I hope you enjoyed it. Tune in tomorrow for Common Sense and Good Judgment. Thanks for listening.